Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on demographic dividends. I'm very excited to be moderating this webinar today. Uh, my name is Carolina Cardona. I am an assistant scientist in the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm also the technical coordinator for the Demographic Dividend Initiative at the Gates Institute. Today's event is the first one out of a series of interviews that the Gates Institute is organizing. This series, the DD Luminaries, has the goal of highlighting the work of outstanding researchers that are investigating the demographic dividend. For this event, we have the great privilege of having Dr. David Canning as our guest. Dr. Canning is one of the early pioneers in demographic dividend research. Um, I would also like to mention that today's event um, is being co-hosted in conjunction with the International Conference on Family Planning that will take place this November in Thailand. So I'm gonna start by sharing some logistics information. For today's event, we have interpretation available. And at the end of this webinar, we're gonna have a 10 minute Q&A session. For this Q&A, we're gonna ask you to please post your questions in the chat box. Um, we're not gonna allow participants to unmute themselves because we want to minimize the use of microphones uh, because some may have connectivity issues, so we want to avoid them. Now, let me introduce our wonderful panelists. Uh, first, we have the great pleasure of having Dr. David Canning today as our special guest. Dr. Canning is the Rachel Salton Stoll Professor of Population Sciences and also Professor of Economics and International Health at Harvard University. And he is one of the pioneers in conducting research in demographic dividend. Uh, for this interview, we have the pleasure of having Ian Salas as the interviewer. Uh, Dr. Salas is an assistant scientist at Johns Hopkins University, and his area of research is applied microeconomics. Uh, we also have Dr. Alan Cavagani as our discussant. Uh, Dr. Cavagani is a lecturer at Makerere University in Uganda. Um, I would also like to highlight that both Dr. Salas and Dr. Cavagani are co-chairs of the Demographic Dividend Subcommittee at the International Conference on Family Planning. So without further ado, uh, let's give the floor to Dr. Cannon and Dr. Salas, and let's listen to this wonderful interview. We are pleased to have as our special guest, Dr. David Cannon. He is the Richard Salton Stoll Professor of Population Science and Professor of Economics and International Health in the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. His research focuses on the role of demographic change and health improvements in economic development. Uh, we'd like to welcome you, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne. David, you are one of the key thinkers on the demographic dividend. How would you define the demographic dividend for a lay audience? And why do you think it is a powerful concept or idea? Yeah, so I think there's you know, a long history of people being very concerned about population issues and particularly overpopulation. And the issue of you know, large scale population growth, putting strains on resources uh, and causing immiseration, uh, the Malthusian world uh, has, has, has a long history. Um, and I think the, uh, the interesting thing about that is over the last hundred years, the empirical evidence really haven't borne that out. So what we've seen is the population of the world has gone from under a billion people a hundred years ago to over seven and a half billion uh, today. So we've had this enormous population growth at the same time as having uh, enormous economic growth. So many countries have got very rich and now even the poorest countries uh, are starting to catch up. And so actually population growth has gone hand in hand with economic growth. And that led, I think, to a decline in interest in population issues, that, that simple empirical finding. Uh, but I think what was missing from that uh, debate is the uh, effect of age structure. And overall, population growth hasn't been bad. But what we find is it's really not so much about total population numbers, but the age structure of the population. Um, so when you have a lot of working age people, your economy does well. Uh, and when you have a lot of children, uh, a lot of dependents, uh, that's going to lower income per capita. Uh, and, and more fundamentally, it's really that there are really two sources of population growth. One is 
fertility and one is mortality. So you can get population grow fast because you have very high fertility rate, or you can be lowering the mortality rate so fewer people die. And uh, the mistake I think in the early work was thinking those two effects are symmetric and they're the same, that having high fertility is the same as having low mortality, but they're actually very, very different. And uh, so what we saw is that uh, what we see is population growth due to high fertility tends to be bad, but population growth uh, due to uh, low mortality is actually good. And so the, the, those two different sources uh, have very different effects. And I think that sort of thinking about it in, in those terms, I think it's a real breakthrough, getting away from the simple view, it's just about population numbers. Right, and so you, you... I think you're drawing a connection here um, between Thomas Malthus and proponents that we're thinking in terms of pestilence and, and disease and all of those things because there will be um, uh, population growth will be moving faster than the capability to be able to support that population. I think they were really thinking about fertility effects right. and that the the uh, essentially the the equilibrating mechanism in Malthus is when the population grows, you get high mortality rates uh, mm. to get back into steady state because of your limited natural resources. Right, right. Um, but actually the history of the last hundred years is we've had productivity growth that has outstripped population growth to a very large extent. And that was very, very unexpected, I think. Okay. Uh, and, we've, and we've been able to live in a world with both rapid population growth and rapid economic growth. Whether or not that will continue in the future uh, with, with issues around climate change and global warming and, the, uh, and future pressures is an open question. But the last hundred years, uh, we've definitely achieved this. Oh, you, you mentioned the difference between looking at um, absolute quantities, right? And also the, um, the general composition of the population in terms of ages. And uh, you, you, you're, um, you're coining uh, it as the breakthrough in the analysis. Um, was that something, uh, how did that idea came about to look into age structure effects as it relates to population growth and um, later on economic uh, development? My you know, discovery of this, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't the first person to discover it, but my discovery of it was really uh, came from a project we did it at Harvard. Um, and we were working on a project on emerging Asia, trying to explain why Asia uh, had this phenomenally high growth rate. So Asia in the 70s and 80s, 90s, had these phenomenally high growth rates. And the Asian Development Bank um, asked us to do a project explaining that growth. Um, and I was looking at the economic growth models and and what came out of those models is I was actually trying to find effects of infrastructure, but infrastructure, it turns out, isn't terribly important. It matters, but not a great deal. But we had covariates in those models. And the two key covariates uh, were um, health, the form of life expectancy, and fertility rates. And those um, uh, really drove a lot of the growth. We, we estimated maybe three percentage points, which is about a third of the growth miracle in Asia was due to these health effects. The fact that they have very healthy population uh, and that healthy population basically means low infant mortality, long life expectancies, which is gonna to add to population growth, but they also had low fertility. And those two things seem to contribute enormously. Um, and it was really, uh, I was working with David Bloom on that project. And it was really looking at that, those empirical results that led us to, to ask the question, really, is this what was really driving it? And is, are these effects causal? I think there's a big worry when you get empirical results that they're not causal effects, they're just correlations. But we thought maybe these are really causal and that uh, a healthy population and a population with low fertility is really what's central to economic growth. You, you mentioned you, you have seen this in um, East Asia. Um, have you also seen this in other places? Yeah, we actually, we did a study. Uh, the most uh, striking example is Ireland, if mm -hmm. you want a non-Asian example. Mm -hmm. Ireland actually uh, had a ban on both abortion and family planning um, up until 1979. And so um, 
it had very high fertility rates, about four children uh, per woman, which is very high by European standards up until 1979. But then they legalized the use of contraceptives in 79. And what you see is a very rapid decline in fertility. Uh, and associated with that decline in fertility, you see this uh, economic takeoff in Ireland, uh, sometimes called the uh, Celtic Tiger. So you get th this enormous burst of um, uh, economic growth uh, associated with this drop in fertility. So I think it's another example. It, it, it's not just an Asian uh, issue. And I think there is a concern that, you know, is this just an Asia story? But we see exactly the thing, it's the same thing in Ireland where they had a delayed fertility transition. But when it occurred in the 1980s and 90s, you see this uh, economic boom. Right. Uh, in other places where there was also a decline in fertility, um, like I think Latin America, um, some people feel or think that the, that did not produce a demographic dividend. What are your thoughts on those? Yeah, so we've looked at Latin America and the other area where this has happened is North Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and in both those places, there's been a decline in fertility, but without the associated uh, economic growth. And I think there is this uh, issue about the interaction of the demographics with the economic circumstances. If the two things work well together, you, you basically can get an enormous boost. But all of the demographics is essentially a supply side effect. Uh, it's creating uh, a large working age um, uh, cohort uh, that you can potentially employ. But in order to get them growth, you actually have to employ them. And what you see in uh, uh, South America and in North Africa is large scale unemployment and underemployment. Uh, and so you get this wasted dividend. Uh, in both Asia and Ireland, the economic policies were very export oriented and they were really able to absorb the extra labor in a, in a very productive way. So, so it is crucial. I think the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons we call it a demographic dividend um, is uh, because you have to earn it. When we were starting this, uh, there were other groups who were arguing for phrases like demographic gift and demographic bonus. Mm -hmm. And we argued against those because if it's a gift or a bonus, it sounds like you don't have to do anything. It just arrives. And one of the reasons we wanted to say it's a demographic dividend is a dividend is a return on investment. And so you do have to get your uh, economic policies right. So you do have to get the fertility transition, but you also have to have your economic policies right that you can absorb this large uh, labor force when it becomes available. And not all countries do that. And we, uh, in, in North Africa, for example, what we see is very high rates of unemployment and, and among people with uh, degrees, um, large scale underemployment, they're not, they're not in uh, jobs that are using the skills. Um, so there are, uh, you do have to earn the dividend. It is not automatic. Right. Would you say that's one of the common misperceptions about the demographic dividend? Uh, I know that people have been trying to put forward that there's the, that potential, right, for many countries to earn it. But um, some people, maybe misinterpreting it as something that uh, will be, like you said, just a gift or a bonus that just comes along um, when the timing is, is right. Yeah, so I think that you're, that's one mis misperception. Uh, mm -hmm. The other one is that um, you know, there, there is some of the demographic dividend is an accounting effect. It's just if you have fewer children, you have fewer uh, capitas, uh, and you have a bigger share of the population is working age. And you get this sort of accounting effect. You have more workers per, per capita, and that gives you a boost on your income per capita. But I think really the other thing that's happening during demographic dividend is behavioral change. Whenever women have fewer children, they uh, enter the labor market and work. And so what we saw in both Asia and in Ireland is the decline in fertility which goes from about you know, six down to less than two children per woman. That decline in fertility is associated with an enormous increase in female labor supply. Again, that has to be productively absorbed, but women working is another boost to the economy. So it's not just about age structure, it's also this behavioral effect. In addition, when you have fewer children, 
you get another dividend in the form of investments in those children. With fewer children, you can invest more in their health and their education. And then the next generation, you're going to see uh, higher returns. So there are, these behavioral effects are actually the major part of the dividend. I think early on, um, people were emphasizing, I think, too much the accounting effect, which is still there. But these behavioral changes are really key. You mentioned, David, that um, when you discovered this, this effect, right, and seeing that there's, it's not only an accounting effect, but there are behavioral um, um, changes that uh, accompany it, that magnify its, its, its impact on the economy. Um, was that something that uh, fellow economists and other interested parties um, accepted right away? I think there was a lot of resistance okay. uh, uh, to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, it's one of the inter an interesting thing is it's one of the ideas. I think it's been it's much easier to explain and sell to policymakers. Uh, they 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 grab they grasp the idea actually very readily. Um, and uh, uh, for economists, are always worried about causality. And uh, we began this uh, whole enterprise with macro regressions, and. An issue with macro regressions is they're not randomized trials. You have maybe data on 150 countries at most. And you have 150 data points and you're trying to explain why some countries are growing. And you have lots of variables explaining that and lots of things changing at the same time. So the Asia had the fertility uh, transition and demographic dividend, but lots of other things were changing in Asia as well. And getting causality out of those macro models uh, I think is, is, is really not feasible. I think we got very suggestive evidence. The evidence is very consistent with demographic dividend, but I think a lot of economists were, um, uh, not convinced by the macro uh, arguments. Um, so I, I think there was a, a debate and to some extent still is uh, on the macro side. Uh, uh, my own work has moved much more towards micro and uh, doing randomized controlled trials, uh, because I think if you, you know, we need some very high quality evidence uh, that this effect works. And the macro, I think, is very suggestive, but it's never going to be convincing. But I think that's true of all macro models, all macro estimates. They're suggestive, and that's where the ideas come from, um, that you see these large associations. Uh, but whether it's truly causal is a, is, a, is a very tough question. You know, my view on the demographic dividend uh, from an academic perspective is it started out really focused on the macro, on country level uh, relationships. And uh, I think my own feeling about this has moved towards um, very much that it's demographic dividend at the household level, that the, the beneficiaries of demographic dividend are the household. So when, I, uh, when a woman moves to low fertility, uh, she sees uh, her time is freed up to work and the, the, the uh, house gets an income boost. Um, uh, also, they get uh, more investments in the uh, health and education of the children. And so these, these effects, I think you can see at the household level. Uh, it's not just a national level uh, dividend. Mm -hmm. I think one of the really exciting things about demographic dividend is it's actually explosive. So what happens is when women move to low fertility and work um, and you educate children, get good health of children, there's a spillover effect that those ideas uh, permeate society. And so what you see is that this often happens in leading groups in society and the highly educated, but it quickly diffuses so this ideation, I think, is incredibly important. And it's one of the reasons, I think, that the demographic dividend is so rapid and was so rapid in Asia. Right. We're, we're now, uh, we just got a paper accepted um, uh, with a randomized trial in Malawi, where we okay. randomized uh, uh, provision of family planning services. And that led to an uh, increase in contraceptive use, uh, a reduction in fertility, and actually... Uh, uh, led to avoidance of short birth intervals, which are risky for the health of the children. We see uh, children's uh, height improves and their cognitive ability goes up uh, with the intervention and women work more. So that I think is a convincing cause 
simple story because it's a randomized trial. Um, we, don't have a, we don't have a large number of those in demography. We have very few randomized trials and very few that go all the way from uh, an intervention to the, all of the demographic dividend uh, outcomes. And I think we need some of that, but I, I, I think it's there. Um, but, I think, but I do think it's, a, it's an important part just to basically uh, address the issues of the, of the people who are still querying this as a causal effect and say, here's a randomized trial and here's the effect sizes. You mentioned that perhaps uh, policymakers were the more receptive um, kind to the demographic dividend as an idea and as a practical um, question. Um, do you think that has permeated the conversation around uh, family planning, reproductive health, and how uh, the demographic dividend provides that kind of framework for understanding linkages between um, what happens in that particular sector and the rest of the economy? Yeah, no, I, th I think the demographic dividend has, has sort of provided a, a unifying uh, uh, concept. And I think more generally, uh, the demographic di dividend brought population issues back into the development economics debate. Um, there was a report in, I think, in 1984, the National Academy of Sciences uh, did a report on population and development. And they found this empirical finding that there was no effect of population growth on economic growth. And uh, that negative result basically meant, I think a lot of people, a lot of policymakers said, well, population issues really aren't that important and it's not part of our development strategy. What that report missed is this fact that you have to really distinguish between population growth due to low fertility and population growth due to low mortality. And it, it didn't do that. And that was the big insight. And if you separate those two things out, each on its own is incredibly important. Um, but you know, the, the simple population model says that you could have a country with very high fertility, but very high mortality and no population growth. So if you have a country in Africa with incredibly high fertility, but very high death rates uh, from infant mortality and AIDS, your, your population won't grow. And you have another country which uh, has low fertility and invests in people and children and has very low mortality. And the model was saying those two countries are the same because of the same popula total population growth, but it's actually completely wrong. They're very, very different countries. And so that insight, I think, uh, really uh, shifted the debate academically. And then I, I, I was um, uh, surprised to some extent how receptive policymakers were to this. I think the arguments around investing in health, uh, and again, uh, I was part of the World Health Organization Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, looking at the causal effects of health on economic growth. And there again, it's macro regressions, not terribly convincing. Academics were actually uh, very concerned about that. But the policymakers think, well, invest, you know, they like investing in health and they like economic growth. And the two things going together was something they were, they were, they were very happy with. Um, and so I think there has been a big policy response here even though the evidence base, I think, is uh, from the, if you take it from the higher standards of intellectual rigor, you could question it. But I think the evidence base is convincing. I think you've written a paper with T. Paul Schultz uh, about some of uh, the discussions uh, in, in the field. Do, do, how does the demographic dividend also inform um, some of the thinking around rights-based approaches to family planning and reproductive health? Yeah, so I think the CARO agenda was a real turning point in uh, family planning. And this uh, move away from population uh, family planning for population control purposes to a rights-based approach was really fundamental. I think that also went hand in hand with this National Academy of Science report saying that the population control wasn't actually needed. Um, and so whenever we came in with our demographic dividend, it essentially gave a, a a return to an economic argument for um, uh, a family planning. Uh, but I think we've tried to emphasize in our work is that we think that it should all be done within a rights-based approach, is that 
government should make family planning available. Uh, they should educate women, but women should be free to choose if they want to use uh, contraception, if they want to use abortion. Uh, there shouldn't be any coercion. And if the women use it, they will benefit, but they're the right people to make that choice. I don't think governments are the right people uh, to make that choice. Different people will make different trade-offs. And I think one of the keys of economics, if you want to maximize welfare, people should be free to choose. Uh, and people are their own best uh, guides for their uh, best decisions. And I'm very, I think that's the right approach. Women should be well informed, they should be given options. But uh, to have coercive family planning in order to create income per capita, I think is, is very, very misguided. Uh, because it, it, it confuses income per capita as human welfare. And human welfare is a much wider uh, concern. And I do see this in some policymakers. They fall into this habit that it's all about income per capita. Um, and you do see uh, the reemergence and sometimes statements around uh, targets of the number of women to adopt family planning. And I'm very uncomfortable with those. I, I'm, I, I'm actually very comfortable with a rights-based approach. Um, but I think this emphasizes that we do want to give that uh, women those choices will also have economic benefits. Um, and I would emphasize that you know, it's not just about uh, information. I think there's a real issue around uh, education of girls and women and empowerment so that they are able to make decisions. And there's an agenda now, I think, within development economics, arguing that empowerment of women is actually one of the keys for development. And I, I would agree with that. And it's, it's really making, uh, making sure that women are full and equal citizens and able to make decisions both in the reproductive health, but also in the wider economic and social spheres. In terms of sub-Saharan Africa, so, so this is probably the area where people think um, a lot of change can take place uh, in the future that would have ramifications for not only its citizens, but um, the rest of the world. Uh, you, are you feeling hopeful about their capability to um, reap that potential for the demographic dividend in sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah, I'm actually much more optimistic, I think, than many uh, uh, people in the international organizations, uh, it's like the World Bank and IMF. I'm actually very optimistic about Africa. And as I said, I the real reason is, if you just look at the aggregate numbers, it doesn't seem much is happening. The economic growth is picked up a little bit, uh, but the fertility transition is very slow in Africa in the aggregate numbers. And so the projections of the United Nations are for a very slow fertility decline and a demographic dividend, which is very modest coming over a hundred years. Whereas Asia's uh, dividend was very large, but was in about 30 to 40 years. Uh, but I think there's a real prospect of a, a takeoff in Africa. Um, and it's, as I said, it's really that the, you do have these leading groups in Africa. So the national numbers are not moving very much. So they're fairly static. And there's been a lot of discussion about a stall in fertility in Africa, that fertility has come down, but it's now stalled at a reasonably high level. But if you look at the uh, capital cities, if you look at women who have at least a high school education, in many African countries, they're at replacement fertility. There are two or less. Uh, they're now they're a small part of the overall populations, but th that those leading groups have moved to low fertility really gives me um, optimism that the, the uh, that others will follow. And this is what we saw in, in Asia. The other thing is, I went back, and if you, um, it's really interesting to go back to the nineteen read reports in the nineteen seventies of prospects for economic growth in Asia. And they were very negative. It actually, it's, a, it's very like reading Afri about Africa today. No one thought, and if you read reports in, uh, from 1970, no one in uh, the international think tanks or the NGOs was predicting China's rise. Uh, China was lar largely agricultural. It had an economic system, which uh, uh, was people thought was doomed to failure. And there were basically zero prospects of China uh, being a major uh, source of either demographic change or um, economic growth. Uh, and the same for South Korea. Uh, again, after the Korean War, very, it was in, impoverished and very poor prospects was the consensus. But they, uh, they surprised us. 
And I think Africa is uh, very like Asia in the early 70s. Uh, it looks like not much is happening. It looks very static, but it has the potential uh, for takeoff. But I would say you have to have both the fertility transition and then you need the economic policies in place to harness that well. And not all countries do that. So there, there is a, there's a very important uh, caveat there about whether Africa will be able to uh, harness this economic growth. I think, I believe um, you've written this up in terms of sequencing of, of different policies, right? Um, prioritizing per particular uh, policies at a certain point, depending on the, their um, stage in the, in the demographic transition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in, in some African countries where uh, they're still impoverished, very high infant mortality rates, mm -hmm. uh, you really want to work on infant mortality and girls' education. Uh, those are sort of uh, the driving forces. Once you have those things, once, once you have uh, women fairly well educated, you have uh, infant mortality coming down, uh, you have the desire for smaller family sizes and family planning becomes more important. But then also your labor market and the, your ability of the labor market to absorb workers becomes important. We, we did a report on Africa. And I think one of the things you mentioned there is that different countries are at different stages. And it, it, there's not just one set of policies that's right for all countries. It really depends on what, what stage you're at. Um, so for example, I think um, you know, in most African countries, the issues around savings aren't really germane at the moment. Uh, people, you know, people aren't really saving for retirement or that they're not really trying to do that yet. That will come in the future and it'd be good to have those institutions set up, but it's, but it's not key. So it really depends on what stage uh, you're at. What are what are the key issues? Um, so I, I I do think that uh, for me the the important thing is having a population and demographic dividend at the center of the uh, economic development debate. So I think if you go back 20 years, uh, it had dropped off the map. And when people talked about economic development planning, uh, they were focused on other issues. And the population issue would be part of the health ministry, maybe. And it would be a separate budget item. But it wouldn't be something that the Minister of Finance or the, uh, the growth commissions would be really interested in. It was a rights-based approach, which they had to do. Um, and I think... Uh, Bringing this into the economic development debate and seeing those synergies has put much more emphasis on population issues in people's thinking. And um, I think uh, having the, uh, the planning commissions and the finance ministries think about uh, these issues, I think the really, the really key thing is, and this has happened, I think, both with health and with population, is uh, not just consumption goods. People like health and they like to, to do a rights-based approach to family planning. But if you can get a finance minister uh, to think that these are investment goods, that the health investments and the investments in providing family planning services are going to lead to economic growth, that gets them really excited. And then they see, uh, and, that, and I think it raises the priority of these and they become more central uh, to, the, uh, to the government's planning. And I think that is, uh, you know, that, that's been really fundamental, I think, in changing the way people think about this. And so if they, if they really think that, uh, uh, they've done this with education. If you go back 30 or 40 years, education was seen as a social sector, not an economic one, which is bizarre nowadays. It's so, uh, it's so common to think of uh, education as key for economic growth. But that was something that only came in the 1980s. Uh, and I think health and population be the key, the key to economic growth. Is to, it took a bit longer, but it's now there. And it's just been part of that debate. And it's not all going to be the same in every country, but it has to be part of the debate. I believe that you're also um, talking here about um, not having policy silos, right? Um, policymakers thinking about just particular sectors it sounds to me like a whole of government approach or a holistic thinking of seeing the interlinkages between um, different sectors. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, I've, I have found sometimes uh, a view that um, 
population policy is really only about family planning. And I think that's way too narrow. Uh, and my view is a family planning program can contribute to um, uh, women achieving lower fertility when they want it. But a key part of this is they have to want it. And uh, I mean, we've done a randomized trial. There were trials in MATLAB and Navrongo. And a really good family planning program will uh, reduce um, uh, fertility by about one child per woman. It essentially addresses the unmet need. But the demographic transition is really about women moving from high desired fertility to low desired fertility. There is an unmet need issue, but it's actually a small, uh, you know, it's a small component. Most of the change is in desired fertility. And that's about women's empowerment, it's about education uh, levels it's a, of women, and it's about getting uh, infant mortality down to, uh, to get rid of the, uh, the replacement incentives. So you have to think about this big picture uh, of all of these things uh, and not just about family planning. And so I think it, you know, family planning is part of this story, uh, but it's only part of the story. Right, right. Um, governments always have a lot of pressure on them to get their economic policies right. Uh, uh, and I would say uh, one of the key things we push as well is in order to get the fertility transition, that just doesn't happen by itself. The fertility transition comes because women choose to have uh, smaller families. And that's, you know, a, a part of that is having good uh, family planning programs available. But the major thing that happens, I think, is the increase in, in women's education and empowerment. Whenever women are well-educated and empowered and they have labor market opportunities, uh, they move towards smaller families. Um, and that, uh, that aspect of the transition uh, also is really important. What's happening in Africa at the moment is you know, the fertility transition at the national level is very slow. Uh, and so I think these changes uh, are coming in Africa, but Africa hasn't really seen the, the dividend yet. But if it wants a dividend, um, what, we, what you would like to see is a faster fertility transition, but also uh, the economic policies in place to harness um, the, the labor supply. Thank you, David and Ian, for that wonderful interview. I think we all learn a lot from your conversation. And now we're going to have uh, Alan Cavagani joining us. Uh, Dr. Cavagani is going to be our discussant today. Um, so I'll the floor is yours, Alan. Thanks, Carolina, for the introduction. And I'm just going to speak into context with what David has um, presented to us. Um, just to remind us, when you talk about the DD, which is the demographic dividend, it's uh, specifically talking about that economic growth um, that results from the decline in a country's births and deaths and the subsequent changes in the age structure of the population. What you see, um, two visuals that relate to Uganda and Singapore, um, specifically where we look at the age structure um, and where we see the broad base, especially for Uganda, uh, speaks to a very big and large young population. And of course, when you talk about the DD, uh, again, linking to what David has taken us through, we're talking about those benefits that come as a result of having a broad um, population in the working age group, which is between ages 15 to age 64 and helps to reduce in the dependency ratios. So um, I want to link the conversation that we've been listening to, to what Population Reference Bureau has helped us to um, ably link to the demographic dividend, where there are four wheels that are discussed here and where we have issues to do with health, education, the economy, and governance. Talking about, again, linking to what David has taken us through, um, the different investments that could be done for all these different specific sectors in different countries, right from national to the lowest level, to be able to harness what we call the benefits that can um, come through from the dividend. And of course, these link to the population um, structure. Again, um, when you talk about uh, what is happening in terms of the conversation related to the demographic dividend, um, we're seeing scholars coming through, but also at the national and global level, 
We are seeing commitments that are coming through, um, like what we know very well about the SDGs, the 2030, the FP 2030, and then the Africa Agenda. We've also seen a lot, lots of investments that are coming through at, in different regions. Uh, for instance, the World Bank investments in the Swed um, um, countries. So all these conversations and interests we're seeing at the global level and still with the countries committing to ensuring that the population aid structures, especially for the low income um, countries, seeing to it that um, there are changes and um, the, these countries can, these uh, population and uh, the specific structures can be transformed or be equipped to be able to um, in, and have that investment. And we're talking about investments, again, that links to the wealth that I've just shared with you. We're talking about the human capital investments. And again, in the recent um, um, conversations that have come through, we're seeing uh, different efforts that are linking still with the DD, but at national and subnational level where we are seeing the transitions, the shifting, and then being able to track so when we look at the gender demographic dividend index that was developed recently, and then the demographic dividend um, effort index by um, the Gates Institute, uh, Johns Hopkins University. So all these are speaking to the fact that yes, while there's this need, there are efforts that are being done. And again, we recognize the fact that we've seen um, efforts that have been made elsewhere. So in terms of uh, the conversations that we've had, David has actually shown us the fact that there are many programs that are going on. So while we talk about, yes, the investments, and let's say when we talk about family planning programs, they're very good. But to date, we still see quite a big number of the population of young women who are sexually active, but they still have issues to do with unmet need, which basically are talking about they want to delay or limit or even space their butts, but they're not using anything. And there are also associated um, thoughts that have been raised with regard to the admit need. There are issues of geopolitics and the physical policy. So we are talking about these poor countries. We are saying their economies have to grow. We are saying that they, they should be able to invest. However, we also need to take into consideration of the different uh, burdens that the countries have, especially talk about like the physical policy. Then very, very critical, um, as we discuss the issues of these countries, we also take, need to take into consideration the uniqueness. Every country is unique. While we may have the different classifications that we have, but when you look at the specific um, policies that have been made at country level, actually speak and show what is happening at the different levels. And then issue of education. I liked what David mentioned where we have to emphasize the education of women. However, we also have had scholars who come through to say, yes, we are educating women, but we need to educate everyone so that we have that investment. Quality versus quantity, free education, universal education for all. However, also with thoughts and um, linkages to ensure that there's skilled education to be able to participate in the labor market. As I wind up, yes. Um, this shows us uh, at least a, a geographic distribution of education. When you talk about education, this is in real time. Uh, some of the data and this uh, credited to Population Reference Bureau. You can be able to access this information online. But the beauty with this, it, there are different metrics that are done, are presented, and they show us where the different countries start at. So still, even with the conversations of investments, and again, we're talking about reaping from the dividend, we can be able to see visually what is happening globally versus where the need is. And also in terms of education and other different sectors. So you're able to access and we're able to see this, which is very good um, to us as we discuss and see where best to have the investments. Yes, um, when we speak about um, the demographic dividend and the efforts that have been made over time, I went through and as I was thinking, I also noted one of the critical, and there's a lot of evidence that has come through where we see even the different efforts that have been done over time, we notice um, quite a great impact that has come through, say when we had the COVID-19. Overall, we see the poor countries were really hit. We noted where countries were struggling to open up after the lockdown, but they needed to have quite a proportion of their population vaccinated, there were no vaccines, 
And then, of course, the issue again of the increased debt burden, where we see again a lot of uh, countries went into borrowing. So as we talk about the declines at household level in terms of wealth, where are these women? Where are these young people who were going to school and during the time of COVID there was closure? Then we notice also again, you know, um, some loss where we talk about issues to do with the girl child education. Some actually conceive, especially in the poor countries. So while we have count or we count the different gains that have come through, again, some countries had um, serious impact. I want to show you visually. Yes, uh, this visual, it's uh, just a summary that I showed, but this, this is a very good report that speaks to the context of Africa, especially with the effects of the pandemic. And to ask the demographers and the scientists and all the different people here, the question that comes in for even other poor countries, for the dividends that have come through, we're talking about what has come through at the different levels in different countries, but we still see as recent as 2021, um, in terms of information that has come through where some close to 58 million people were actually falling back into that, um, falling back into poverty. You know, they had crossed the poverty line and we're seeing them going back um, to that. So this is just a few, but there's quite a lot of information. And um, as I wind up, or as I conclude, in the context of what David mentioned, I, I certainly agree when we look at a lot of evidence that is available that yes, um, the transition is quite a little bit slow, where there are also conversations that are coming through uh, from some scholars who believe and still think that we have fertility transition, others, uh, there's the fertility stalls in some countries, especially in Africa, but there's also a lot of evidence of where there are lots of um, investments that have been done, and also different development partners and the global commitments that are coming through. Just to also highlight that um, while we talk about the DD, the demographic dividend, and what has been like, we have success stories from the Asian um, tigers and the number of some that have been able to achieve. So we can learn from them, but it takes the government a critical role in terms of making deliberate efforts and investments and being able to track those investments at different levels. Some have gotten to the level of domesticating what we call domesticating the demographic dividend. Again, the impact of COVID-19 cannot be underestimated. And again, those efforts that have been gained, we can still have them or, um, have them underscored. Um, as in my last uh, thoughts, uh, Africa has a great opportunity, especially when we talk about the high fertility countries. Yes, we can be able to achieve the demographic dividend, with the right adequate investments and resources in place. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Alan. Um, that was a great discussion. Um, David, I'm gonna let you, if you want to answer some of Alan's questions before we go into the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I would just say, uh, I appreciate, uh, especially bringing out this point about COVID. I think COVID has had a very negative effect uh, on the economy, on the health sector and on family planning. And so it is quite a big uh, shock. Uh, I'm, I'm, I hope that it is a temporary one and that we can get back to normal, but it, uh, it has been, I think, a, 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 a very large effect. And we're not, I think we, we, the evidence so far uh, is that it's having very large effects on healthcare utilization and I think on, uh, uh, on family planning. Uh, you also mentioned uh, you know, the role of governments. And I do think governments here are really important. Um, you know, the, the issues around what, uh, what are the causes of economic growth are, I think, very contentious, and there are lots of different um, actors there. Um, and I think I'm um, uh, in the camp that the, it's not just the Washington consensus of a, a free market approach, it is that the, the successful Asian countries tended to have uh, longer term planning and be quite interventionist in the economy. Uh, and I think uh, a guy who's really good on this uh, is Ricardo Hassman, uh, who's got a, a lot of evidence on um, uh, how, how national policies can be conducive to economic growth. And I think population is an important part of that, but it's only a part of the whole economic growth debate. But I would say, I mean, a, that's a very contentious area about what exactly the right uh, pro-growth policies are. Uh, but I'm, uh, but as I said, I am uh, hopeful and optimistic. But I, maybe we'll open it up then to uh, uh, questions. Thank you, David. Um, so we received 
a lot of questions, so I try to filter them and group them by topic. So I'm going to start with two questions that are from Aftab Muki and Fang Yang. They're both related to the implementation of randomized trials or RCTs in demography. So Aftab asks that there is a challenge in implementing randomized trials in demography because in order to measure the demographic dividend, it might require a long follow-up. And how do you see the change in the environment and the macro variables making it challenging in terms of ascertaining the causality of it? And then there's a one that I'm going to read it because it's related to it. It's from Fang Yang from Peking University. And it's again related from that movement from a macro regression to an RCT in order to address causality. And she asked that for assessing the effect from low fertility um, or low desired fertility on economic growth, she wonders if one could, uh, in, how could one intervene on desired fertility at the, at the individual level? And if so, what might be the ethical implications regarding that? Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have been doing um, quite a few uh, RCTs recently, and it, it, it's really this question of establishing causality. But it's quite right at this point about long-term follow-up. Uh, what we're seeing at the moment is um, the first effects on um, fertility, and both spacing, but also women's work and the uh, human capital of the children. But we'll have to wait um, 20 to 30 years to see that next generation of children's improvement. But I think the there are a lot of aspects of this that are quite short term. We can see effects on child mortality. We can see effects on women's uh, female labor market participation. It, it's very quick. And I think there's a strong parallel here to the, uh, the, the health literature. Um, and so um, I was also involved in this debate around investing in health. And again, it was originally a macro argument uh, that uh, healthy countries, um, you know, health is a form of human capital, makes people more productive. And it's really investing in early childhood health. And we now have, uh, I think, a, a set of uh, a small number of high quality randomized trials. I think. Um, uh, um, Miguel, uh, Ted Miguel, Miguel and Kramer's work on worms, where they did a deworming program. And that's now been followed up for around 30 years. And what they're seeing is that those children uh, have much better paying jobs. Uh, so they saw the short term health benefits, but they see the long term effects. And I think that's the highest uh, uh, standard of, um, of causal evidence. Uh, I must admit, I'm convinced by the the macro evidence. Um, but I think there, there are doctors, and I think from an academic perspective, to answer the doctors, we need we need some of this very high quality data. I, I think we have a huge amount of data supporting this. Uh, so it's more it's more to sort of address the last holes out in, in the uh, in economics. Um, as part of those randomized trials, we improve access to family planning, we undertake uh, counseling. Um, and so uh, uh, there is this issue that it is about informed choice. Uh, and we're quite sensitive to this fact uh, that it should be informed choice. So we give women choices, but it's up to them whether or not they want to take it. Um, and I think the main drivers of that are their own opportunities, which are linked to education and uh, and labor market opportunities. Uh, but we do see, I mean, um, we uh, with a trial in Malawi and in, in all our other trials in other countries, what we see is that improving access to services, uh, removing barriers that uh, does lead to higher uptake of family planning and uh, or may not come in, in those studies is birth spacing and we see birth spacing. We, we can't say whether we see a long-term fertility decline because again, it's a long-term follow-up. What we see as a short-term uh, outcome is um, a, a fewer short birth intervals. So the children are not being born very quickly. Thank you, David. And I'm going to pick up on your comment about women's choice because we have a question that is related to it. So the first one, I'm going to link uh, Oying Ramon's question that he asked about the shift from high to low desired fertility is important from a behavioral change point of view. But it also means um, all the more that availability of family planning becomes even more important. So that's one question. And then another one that is related to that one is from Pramila Bartlett where she asks, what would be the key indicators for the rights-based approach uh, in family planning? Yeah, so um, 
Uh, yeah, there, there is some evidence now that the unmet need for family planning is actually increasing in Africa, even though uh, access to family planning is improving. And I think that's probably a product of this fact that desired fertility is going down quite quickly in Africa. Um, and so the the unmet need is actually could be going up, up even though you're, you're providing more. Um, so I do think that family planning is, uh, it becomes more important when desired fertility declines. Um, uh, there's a good there's a good question about you know the rights based approach. I mean, one thing I've been pushing is that we need more metrics on the rights based approach, and that um, uh, that um, it's not just about uh, unmet need, but that we need to measure uh, uh, coercion and family planning. We need to measure and count and and find out if women are having family planning that they don't want, and. I think that's a that's something that's missing in the literature at the moment, and so I've been working on that. And I would say as well, um, in Africa, there's an enormous problem of um, sterility and childlessness. So there are women who are sterile and want to have children, uh, but for uh, usually for health reasons are not able to. Uh, and I think uh, part of family planning should be uh, helping those women uh, to achieve that. And uh, again, it's this welfare issue is uh, you know, having those children will um, probably mean they have lower income per capita in their households, but they really want the children. They're better off with the children. And so I think the uh, helping women achieve the fertility they desire, uh, whether it's uh, fewer children or more, has to be part of the debate. Thank you, David. Yes, utility is not just income. It is also happiness. <laughs> Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining today's webinar. I'm sorry that I could not address all the questions that we got, uh, but it's 10.30 uh, already. So thank you, David, so much for uh, having you today. Uh, you were our star guest for this DD Luminaries and the inauguration of the first uh, event. Thank you, Alan, for, for the, being the discussant, and also Ian for conducting the interview. And thanks to everyone who joined today.